Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to Encore Learning Presents, the virtual edition. Uh, today, we have Adrian Kotick uh, to help you with your crossword puzzle endeavors. Tips for any, everyone from novices to long-term puzzlers, I guess. Maybe there's a different name for people that do crossword puzzles. We'll find that out too, I suppose. Now, um, we, uh, we will uh, have opportunity for uh, uh, questions and answers. And the way to participate in that process is to use the Q&A function somewhere on your device. You should be able to see an icon that uh, says Q&A. Just press that, uh, put your question in, submit it, and we'll collect them and submit the questions to Adrian at uh, appropriate points in our presentation. If you have any kind of technical problems, you need to send an email to info at encorelearning.net. That's info at encorelearning.net, and they'll help you with troubleshooting to hopefully get you back into the session. So with that, uh, we're going to move on to introduction, and uh, Louise Kenny has the honor of doing that. Louise? Go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm extremely pleased to introduce you to Adrian Kotick. Um, Adrian is a friend of mine. We both live in Alexandria. And I became aware of her expertise in crossword puzzles a little while ago. She said to me that uh, she's been doing crossword puzzles for 60 years. So you'll be surprised because she doesn't look old enough to have been doing them for 60 years, but 60 years. She uh, was a manager for Exxon, um, Exxon Mobil uh, in the IT world for uh, 38 years. And during, during that time, she, uh, she's uh, got developed expertise. Sorry, my husband's listening with a device at the same time. She, she has taught a class um, on uh, crossword puzzles. She has also taught a class on Sudoku. She's really, I guess you would consider a puzzle maven. Um, She's also competed in the New York Times uh, Crossword Puzzle Tournament in Stanford, uh, Connecticut, which, as you may know, is really the gold standard of competitions in the crossword puzzle world. So uh, Adrian is going to enlighten us about how crossword puzzles work, some tips, uh, tips of the trade to, uh, to improve your uh, crossword, puzzle, uh, crossword puzzle skills. So Adrian, I'm happy to send it on to you. Hey, thank you, Louise, and uh, thank you to uh, Encore Learning for this opportunity. Um, as Louise has indicated, I love puzzles, all kinds of puzzles. I love to solve things, to compete with myself. Uh, I like to push my mental limits. So this class is an attempt to organize the kind of chaotic way that my brain solves crossword puzzles so I can share that information with you. Uh, Solving crossword puzzles is a game, and like any game, it's uh, more fun when you get better at it. So that's my goal here, just to help you become better so you'll just have more fun doing your puzzles. So these are some of the topics we're going to be covering. I'll be talking about crossword puzzles in general, uh, then some guidelines overall for solving puzzles. We'll have lots of specific tips with with examples for each one. And then we're going to do one awesome crossword puzzle. I'm not actually going to do it. I, I'm just going to demonstrate it to you. And I use the word awesome here in its original sense. It's uh, a puzzle that actually will, it still instills awe in me every time I look at it. So why should you do crossword puzzles? Well, first of all, you'll learn stuff. You'll learn vocabulary. You'll learn facts. You'll learn culture. Uh, for, for example, I recently just learned from a crossword crossword puzzle that orchestras tune to the oboe, O-B-O-E, a four-letter word with three vowels, which are favorite words of crossword puzzle constructors. You don't need to start with an encyclopedic knowledge of trivia or know all the words in the dictionary or be an expert speller, and I'm certainly not going to teach you any of that, but you probably already know way more than you give yourself credit for. And by doing puzzles, I think you'll also get a greater appreciation for the beauty and the flexibility of the English language. So it will make you smarter. It's not a measure of intelligence, but it does make you smarter. It makes the most of the way your brain already works. Uh, it's a great workout um, for spatial perception, for flexible thinking, pattern recognition, information retrieval from your memory, spelling and grammar. 
um, patience, concentration, focus, all of those things. And those are all learnable skills. So as you do more puzzles and get better at them, your, those skill levels will actually increase. They say it helps prevent brain decay and dementia. I'm not a doctor. I haven't seen the studies on that. Whatever, it wouldn't hurt. It's also very accessible. It's cheap, it's ubiquitous. You can find puzzles everywhere and you can do them anywhere, anytime. I say it's uh, very satisfying. You're in a competition with the constructor and the editor of the puzzle, but they both want you to win. They, it, it feels good for us to, to fill in empty spaces, to create order and meaning. And you get that sort of aha feeling that, that uh, I find so very satisfying. You get closure. And I say it's fun. It should never be drudgery. Um, as we said, they become more fun as you get better at them. Um, puzzles were invented in uh, 1913. The first one appeared in the New York World, the now defunct newspaper. Uh, it was a huge craze in the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s. Uh, with fashion and, and uh, all kinds of things that you could buy with puzzle themes. They say it's now the most popular indoor sport that 50 million people solve puzzles. I don't know where they come up with that number, but I have heard it and I'm just gonna pass it along. Okay, some basics. All right, we need to talk about the rules. This is very important. There are no rules. It's your puzzle, you do it however you like. Uh, you do, can do them online or on paper. If you do it on paper, you can use pen. I recommend an erasable ballpoint. You can do it with pencil. And I, recognize, I recommend Dixon Ticonderoga number two. All crossword puzzle people use Dixon Ticonderoga number two, and they're not paying me to say that. Um, it just has the perfect uh, lead and it's the perfect eraser for, for smooth erasing. All right, so since there are no rules, there's no such thing as cheating. When you get stuck, you should use whatever reference materials, whatever outside help you need. And there's a couple of good reasons why you should go ahead and do that. You'll learn something new, uh, and that's always a good end in itself. And you'll avoid frustrating dead ends. Um, so that, you know, sometimes it'll open up a section of the puzzle where you're completely stuck and you'd have to give up the whole puzzle you get one more word and then maybe you can finish it and, you know, get that aha feeling that's, you know, the satisfaction of finishing. So when I say you learn something new, for example, um, I'm pretty good at geography. I know movies, but I'm not good at rap music and I'm not very good at sports. So I look these things up. I learn for the next time. Um, I, I'm not very good at opera. But anyone who does a puzzle knows the word aria, a solo in opera, A-R-I-A. -A, there's another one of those four letter words with three vowels. So anyway, there's a lot of lot you can learn just by filling in the blanks there. As far as online puzzles, uh, I do the Washington Post puzzle online and I do the New York Times puzzle online. I subscribe to both and for the New York Times, you need an extra subscription level to be able to do their uh, puzzles online. But one thing I really like about the New York Times puzzles is it keeps statistics. Right now I have six years worth of statistics. So I know my streaks, how many puzzles I've successfully completed in a row. I'm up to now about 11 months of successfully completing every day. And, you know, if that sounds a little obsessive to you, well, you know, yeah. My record is 15 months, which ended when I was on vacation in Greenland. And the Wi-Fi in Greenland is very unreliable. I was in the middle of a puzzle and it dropped me. And that was the end of a 15 month streak. Anyway, uh, they also keep track of your average uh, time and your best time for each day of the week. So the puzzles get more difficult during the week. So it'll take you longer to do one, um, a Saturday puzzle than it will a Monday puzzle. Um, my times are pretty good, but um, I'm a little too slow to actually be competitive on the, the, the tournament circuit. Um, as I said, you have to pay for some of these online subscriptions, but the solving software itself is generally free. Okay, there is, as, before we finish the rules, there is one exception to the no rules rule. 
if you're in a tournament, they do have rules. Looking stuff up is cheating. So that's the one exception to not having any rules at all. All right, now about going easy on yourself. Remember, this is supposed to be fun. It's a game. So puzzling with a friend works with some people. Um, sometimes two heads will you know, just click a little bit better. You have different levels of expertise. Taking a break when you get stuck is always a good idea. You, your brain, for some reason, will continue working in the background and sometimes will come up with the answer when you least expect it. Um, uh, you shouldn't be getting yourself too uh, committed to any particular answer that you've already decided on. That's what erasers and delete keys are for. So just take it easy on yourself and you know, kind of trying to relax into it. I don't recommend making arbitrary demands on yourself. I've known people who said they have to do all of the across clues and they won't do any down clues unless they get completely stuck. Well, that's kind of arbitrary and it just adds an extra level of stress into your solving. And we don't need any stress here. There's no right way to do it. If you wanna start at the top left and work from there, that's fine. If you start in the middle and work out from there, that's also fine, right? Is whatever works for you. Um, you should pick puzzles with the right degree of difficulty for you. You can usually find out what the level of, of uh, difficulty is, as I said, in the Times and in a lot of daily um, publications. The uh, puzzles get harder during the week. So, you know, work on Mondays until you get good at that and then work on, on Tuesdays. And you can buy uh, books of puzzles that are at the right level. Um, you can find them ones that say, you know, this is great for Sunday at the beach and then you get the killer puzzles. So they'll give you some hint of whether it's the right puzzles for you. And do remember, it's only a game, it's only a hobby. There's no race or competition going on. So don't make it into a chore for yourself. You don't wanna to add to your level of anxiety just because you're trying to solve a, you know, a game. All right, another suggestion is to maintain lists. Um, you can maintain lists of helpful answer words, such as common repeaters and obscurities. Keep a cheat sheet. For example, you need to know that the athletes Bobby Orr, O-R-R, -R, and Mel Ott, O-T-T, -T, and Pele, P-L-E, are important people to know because of those letters that are very useful for uh, constructors to put into puzzles. Um, you should know that a single lens reflex camera is an SLR and standing room only is the abbreviation for SRO, SRO is the abbreviation for standing room only. It's good to know about acai berries, very popular these days, and Japanese sashes are OBs, OBI. You'll always see Lake Erie, E-R-I-E, um, the famous Hawaiian goose. And Nene, N-E-N-E, -E, which no one would ever have to know unless you go to Hawaii or unless you do crossword puzzles. The fencing sword is an epi, E-P-E-E, -E, and the word summer in French is E-T-E. -E. And you'll notice that these are all short words, vowel heavy, easy letters for the constructors to use for filling in their puzzles. The, more, the three and four letter words uh, with the most common letters, the vowels, T, N, S, R, are the ones that appear all the time. If it helps you, keep lists. Um, and of course, practicing. Your mental flexibility will improve the more you do these puzzles. There are many great books on how to solve puzzles. Um, I also recommend there's a video called Wordplay, a documentary about the New York Times crossword puzzle tournaments and the people who compete in them, the people who construct and edit puzzles, and some famous solvers. Bill Clinton was a famous one, John Stewart, and they appear in, in that video. So if you can find it, it's very interesting. Okay, let's go over some nomenclature and the basic structure of most puzzles. I'm assuming that most people are, you know, are pretty familiar. If you sign up for this class, you're probably already doing puzzles, but there may be a few facts I'm going to throw out that you may not have been aware of. They're usually square, equal number of rows and columns, and it's usually an odd number of squares in each direction, so you can have an interesting middle um, uh, entry going across. Um, the number, they're symmetric, they usually have diagonal symmetry, that means if you spin it 180 degrees, the pattern of black and white squares will be the same 
uh, either way. The uh, cross and down clues are numbered. The answers, or of course, are entered at, in the grid at the starting numbers. There should be no islands. You should never have black squares completely isolating any section. It should all be interconnected, and there should be no unchecked squares. Every square should have both a cross and a down uh, clue uh, or answer associated with it. Words in American puzzles are at least three letters long. The answers are also called entries or fill. They can be words. They can be multi-word phrases, proper nouns, abbreviations, kind of anything that can fit into, you know, looking like a, a word. The crossings are the intersections between answers. Many puzzles will have a theme, which is a motif or characteristic uh, of, of several of the entries, usually the longer entries and usually symmetrically arranged in the grid. And we'll talk more about themes a little later. And the clues and answers will agree. That means they're interchangeable in a sentence. And we'll talk some more about what we mean by agreement there. Um, just because I've heard this question a lot about whether uh, computers can actually start creating decent crossword puzzles, and pretty much the answer is no. There are no good crossword puzzles constructed by computer. They all require a human constructor and an editor with really hardworking, clever brains. The computers are mainly used these days to construct the grid, to maintain symmetry of the black and white squares, and to do the numbering, like the really annoying chores. And there's some really good um, online compilations of lists of words and the clues associated with them. So if you're stuck, you can go to uh, look for xwordinfo.com. It's a really excellent uh, guide to all of these clues. They keep track of pretty much every entry that's ever been done in a recent crossword puzzle and the clues associated with it. And it's a huge database, but really useful. Okay, let's talk about the quality of puzzles. There's the hard puzzles, the easy puzzles, and what I call the challenging ones. If it's too hard, and if it has too much obscure trivia, if it requires too much specialized knowledge, it'll just feel like drudgery. Specialty publications may have puzzles uh, directed to a, a particular audience. You might have in a golf magazine, you might have a lot of golf phrases that anyone who doesn't play golf wouldn't know, but they would be too hard for anyone else. Um, the two easy ones, you know, if you sail through it without having to do much thinking, it's just not satisfying. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle with 12 big clunky pieces that are great for a four-year-old, but you get pretty tired of those really quickly. So the Goldilocks puzzles is one that I call just challenging. It's a quality that's best for you. It requires some brain stretching, maybe some learning, but it is sol solvable. It should be fun. It should be satisfying. Of course, your mileage may vary in uh, what you consider hard, easy, or challenging. And in fact, what you consider too hard may become easier as you get better at it. But uh, I think a puzzle should just be kind of challenging in, in order for it to, you get that aha feeling that, you know, you have set satisfied something that, that was difficult. Um, the editor of a publication or a collection of puzzles will decide on, that le on the levels of difficulty. As I said, many daily publications carry, that carry crossword puzzles will increase the level of difficulty from Monday to Saturday. And Sunday is their biggest, but not necessarily the hardest. Uh, there are crossword collection books that often indicate their level of difficulty. Um, in general, if you just look at the puzzle, if there's more white squares and fewer black square squares, that's going to be a harder puzzle. Because without a lot of black squares breaking it into uh, smaller sections, there are more very long answered stack answers stacked on top of each other, and it's harder to break into. So those will be harder puzzles if they have fewer black squares. Uh, and it's the interplay of clues and answers that can be adjusted by the editor or constructor for a particular level of difficulty. A Monday puzzle might clue an answer with a really straightforward definition, while a Saturday clue for the exact same answer might involve wordplay and, and what I call clever misdirection. And we'll talk a lot more about those. Um, 
the characteristics of quality puzzles, in addition to being entertaining and educational, um, the gold standard is the New York Times puzzles, and the editor, Will Schwartz, is by far the best. He's brought up the level of short of crossword puzzles across all publications uh, since he, he uh, moved into his job in 1993. Uh, the mantra that the New York Times uh, puzzle uses for, for selecting what to, to publish is, quote, they're intelligent, literate, entertaining, and well-crafted that appeal to the broad range of solvers. And that pretty much covers, you know, what I call a quality puzzle. It should be sol solvable with hard work and thought, challenging, but, but fair. It should be educational, but not punishing. You don't want to have to feel like you, you know, you're, you're being tested by, you know, your mean first grade teacher. Should, there should be a minimum of difficult specific knowledge answers crossing each other, for instance because uh, that's kind of not fair. You, you can't really learn what that missing letter is if you don't know that specific knowledge, and that makes it too hard. Uh, there should be a good mix of vocabulary, specific knowledge, and wordplay. The field should be lively, it should be interesting, it should be accessible and appealing to a wide variety of ages and backgrounds, and if there's a theme, it should be clever and original. You should have a minimal use of annoying fill and the dreaded crossword ease. Crossword ease is kind of the language of puzzles. It's usually short answers with common letters that constructors must resort to to accommodate difficult crossings. Uh, these are found, these are words that are found more often in crossword puzzles than in real life. There would be obscure facts and words and names. For instance, if you were following tennis in the 1970s, you might remember Ily Nastasi, but today he's best remembered for having a four-letter name with three vowels in it, I-L-I-E. Brian Eno, E-N-O, kind of invented um, elevator music. I have to know his name. Um, there's, this is a really weird one. Cousin It, I-T-T, -T, from the Adams family. Like if you follow Adam's family cartoons, you know ITT, but in general, you know, you've just got a good word with easy letters to cross, and he shows up in, in puzzles all the time. Um, there are, uh, you don't want to have too many partials, those fill in the blanks, or too many abbreviations, variant spellings. Um, the modern text shorthand, uh, which is one of my uh, pet peeves here, I once lost a streak because having retired about 15 years ago, I wasn't confronted with getting emails from someone who didn't want you to open it well if the boss could see it. So now you put in the subject line, NSFW, not safe for work. Who knew? I didn't know, I didn't need it for work and I didn't know it for puzzles. So I ended up having to call my daughter and. You know, she filled me in on that one. But these, this text speak is, is really, it's really tough. I mean, everyone knows LOL and OMG, but there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I just don't know. And so it doesn't appeal to people of my age group very much. And then there are iffy words that are considered crosswordies, um, uh, like putting in a prefix where, to a verb that doesn't quite like re-say like to say again. People don't say re-say, they say say again. But technically re-say would be like a legitimate word. And sometimes they, they put stuff like that in there. They put in exclamations like aha, ho, yike, yike. Funny sounds like bonk and thud. Um, they, these are not really in the language, but they're not quite wrong. And this is what crossword ease is and it's, you know, something you just have to learn to put up with. Okay, when I say it's all about the clues, I want you to, when you do your puzzles, to learn to appreciate the beauty of clue writing. The clue has to be very short. You can't write a whole paragraph to, you know, put in that uh, the column of where the crosses and downs are. It has to be short, but it still has to provide enough information to allow you to solve it and be sure that you're right and it has to have an appropriate level of challenge. So a great deal of thought and talent goes into creating a great clue. 
So just keep that in mind whenever you're solving a puzzle. Sometimes they're, they're just little gems. They should be creative and original and witty. Uh, good constructors tend to have a great sense of humor and a fine-tuned talent uh, for the English language. You have to be aware that many English words have many different definitions and usages and even pronunciations. So this allows the clues to use misdirection, ambiguity, wordplay like puns and double meanings and trickiness. This is what makes puzzles to me the most fun. And you know, it's, it's that flexibility of the English language. So again, an open mind is really essential to, to solving. All right, general guidelines. You need to get a toehold just to start the puzzle. As I said, you could you know, force yourself to start at one across, but that's not what I recommend. The first thing I do is I scan for what we call a gimme. It would be a sure thing. Obvious, easy to spot, unambiguous clues that could have only one possible answer. Partials, like a fill in the blank, is easy to spot and often has only one possible answer. So that, that's, a, that's a good place to start. Or if there's names of well-known people and places and titles that just uh, bounce out at you, that's a good place to start. Um, you can scan for clues that suggest the common pattern, such as a plural almost always will have an S at the end, a past tense, an ED, uh, a gerund will have an ING. There's comparatives and superlatives, so you'll have an ER or an EST at the end. Repeats will usually have RE at the beginning. A negating of a word could have an UN or a DIS at the beginning. Adverbs often end with LY. So you can play the odds. Um, for, an, if, for instance, if there's a clue like a teacher's review tool, play the odds and try test in there. Don't try quiz because you're going to get stuck with Qs and Zs and it's going to be wrong. Okay, looking for short answers, three to four letters. They're usually easier, they're more common, and there aren't that many of them. So the one, and the ones that are used most often have very useful letter patterns with like E's and S's at the end. Uh, the most common crossword answer is ERA. It's clued as either an era, like a time period, or abbreviation for the Equal Rights Amendment, or the abbreviation for earned run average, and there's probably a few others that are missing, but that's the single most used uh, answer in crossword puzzles. And I suggest you don't start by guessing the answer to an ambiguous clue or a long answer or a theme entry. Wait until you have some crossing letters. All right, as I said, use what you've already entered. Go for answers where there are already some letters filled in. Our brains are wired to fill in the blanks. So if you've got a few letters there, your brain may just tell you what those missing letters are. Work a whole section. You can keep a whole section in your head at one time by remembering a few interlocking clues. Uh, work with known letters at the beginning of an answer because they're more useful for your brain to figure out what comes after it. And they can be used to look up answers in reference materials. Uh, take advantage of less, less common crossing letters. If you see uh, J, Q, or Z somewhere in the puzzle, it's gonna, there's going to be fewer words that the crossing word could be. And those are really good, uh, good clues for you. Uh, your knowledge of English and spelling is probably better than you realize. You should trust your natural skills to analyze letter patterns and, and probabilities, especially at the beginning or end of an answer. Um, but you always, of course, have to be wary of odd combos or letters in rare positions. That's, you know, if something just doesn't feel right, you know, pencil it in lightly or, you know, somehow let yourself remember that that's a little bit iffy. And if you have an empty square, just go through the alphabet and test an appropriate letter into each one of them. And sometimes that will make the answer click for you. Expect the unexpected, that is keeping an open mind. And that's a recurring theme in everything that we're gonna talk about here. Don't always assume that the clue is as straightforward as it appears, and don't get stuck on your first interpretation or your first pronunciation. What looks like a simple definition or synonym may be deceptive or ambiguous or deliberately tricky. 
For instance, the word set, S-E-T, has more definitions than any other word in English. Uh, so if you have the word set is your clue when you have come up with a five letter answer, it, a set could be a stage, it could be a group, it could be the past tense of the word fixed, so it would be fixed, and there's probably a hundred other answers. So if you've got an ambiguous uh, clue, don't go assuming that it's straightforward or that it's going to be the easiest one or the first one that comes into your head. Remember that the constructor may be trying to misdirect you uh, to a, uh, make a too obvious assumption or answer. Uh, we tend to know what the, the first answer that comes into someone's head might be, and a clever constructor will kind of steer you into that with where the right answer is something completely different. So read every clue with every possible interpretation and pronunciation. And a, a little tip here, a question mark at the end of a clue usually indicates that there's some wordplay going on. Remember that answers can be a multi-word phrase, name, or title. So phrases will sometimes end with a, a, prepos a preposition, like a clue like pamper might lead to dote on, which will look pretty weird, D-O-T-E-O-N, when you see it as one word, but that could actually be the phrase of two words. And there may be very odd letter combinations uh, in the middle of an answer, like the clue requested might give you the answer asked for, and there you get a DF in the middle where asked and for come together, and that's gonna look weird. So you have to keep in mind that, you know, the answer can be more than one word. There can also be strange results, such as numbers, special characters, multiple letters in, in a square, which is a, a rebus, um, I've seen puzzles where and words had to be entered backwards. You really have to be prepared for something odd. Um, and the, the theme would usually give you a, a hint about what you're looking for there. And always remember your grammar. Answers and clues should be interchangeable. So the verb tense or the noun number or the pronoun person, they must be consistent between clue and answer. All right, there's specific tips. Uh, these are pretty straightforward. You know, there will be an indication on some clues if there's an abbreviation, if it's archaic, colloquial, obsolete, variant spelling, slang, dialect, prefix or suffix, foreign language. And again, that question mark would mean warning you that there's some wordplay. So now we're going to do a bunch of um, specific tips. And I'm gonna show you a lot of, uh, uh, they're gonna have examples for each one. I want you to know that clues are not copyrightable. So I have borrowed clues from all over the place. Um, wherever I see a clever clue, I write it down. I have a huge collection of clues that I find particularly interesting. So it's okay for me to be using these uh, in my slides. All right. The simplest one is the definition, synonyms, and facts. Very straightforward, most common. Angry could lead to irate. Land measures, acre. Author of the ravens, Poe. Biggest landmass, Asia. These are very typical types of clues, giving you a very specific answer, um, usually a synonym or a fact. Uh, there, there is one that I, I have to highlight. Um, I didn't put it on the slide. If you see anything that says sandwich cookie or black and white snack or anything like that, Nabisco uh, product, the answer is going to be Oreo, O-R-E-O. -E it is the official snack of the crossword puzzle world because there again, you've got a four letter word with three vowels and it shows up all the time. Sometimes with really clever, well-researched clues just to you know break the boredom and monotony of that but you've got to know about Oreos. Okay, partials are fill in the blanks. Here's a few uh, examples. My blank will be my tie, snow, cat, from A to Z. Notice that it's a multi-word answer. So it looks a little weird there, ATO, but that's a very frequent actually fill in the blank. Pairings, where uh, they'll, they'll direct you to a word that partners with another word. So partner of neither would be nor, and egg go with is ham, 
and precedes luck or waiter. You would have dumb luck or dumb waiter. So those are those are pairings. Singulars and plural, plurals. A little more interesting and complex than you might think uh, at first glance. If the clue indicates a plural, the answer must be a plural. Singular clues, of course, yield singular answers. There's the basic plural. Vessels gives you boats. Um, it may have words like et al to show that there's going to be a plural or an and will also show a plural like mink, otter, et al can lead to furs. Martin and Charlie are sheens. So those are basic plurals. You have to, of course, be, a, I, I always, I did say play the odds and, you know, pencil in an S, but then you have to be aware of regular plurals like honkers or geese. Hence for singular, um, we have here, uh, let's see, where do I have this? Okay. Uh, the usage of or or for one will indicate a singular or, or just having a clue that is a singular noun. Uh, soprano for one would be a Tony, soprano from you know the show. Dead or red could be C. If it said de dead and red, that would be C's. So just something that those are just some hints for singular words. And then what I call masked grammar. You can't always tell with some words whether they're plural or singular. Like the word craft could yield boat or boats because that word can be both a singular or a plural word. School members could be fish or fishes. Uh, you can't really be sure, well, uh, which one that uh, that clue is asking for. So the plural can, and singular can be uh, a little bit tricky. Some common suffixes and prefixes. If uh, the clue is looking for a noun for someone who does something, try an ER at the end. Um, like a bakery specialist, icer. Icer is a very common uh, crossword puzzle answer. Fast thinker. I put in dieter here, but this is also a very clever clue because you're not thinking fast. You're thinking about someone who thinks about fasts. Fasting is a dieter. Uh, so you've got a double meaning clue there. If the clue indicates a comparative or superlative, try ER or EST at the end of an adjective. If it indicates negation of an adjective, try on at the beginning. Those are just good ways to, to, to start if you can find the way to fit it in. More like a pin, neater, uh, as in neat as a pin. Maximally bright, smartest. Not right, untrue. So that, those are some uh, common uh, suffixes and prefixes. And for adverbs, um, it will often end with an LY. It's worth giving it a try. Way to be disputed, hotly, as in hotly disputed. Clever clue, I think. Okay, verb forms. A third person singular verb is one where the subject is he, she, or it, or a singular noun. The verb almost always has an S at the end. One exception would be multi word answers where the S would be somewhere in the middle. So, has the flu, ails is the answer. Ales could be has the flu. Uh, let's turn that around. They are interchangeable. And the S there would be, or has is in, in the middle. You've got an irregular verb. Um, so you, you wouldn't, you know, the S at the end would not work for that particular clue. If it's a past tense, you know, try ED at the end, but always be aware of possibility of an irregular verb. Speechified is orated. Orate is another very common uh, crossword puzzle answer. Opted would be chose, doesn't have ED at the end because you've got an irregular verb. If the clue indicates a repeated action, um, doing something again or do it anew, something like that that would be in the clue, try RE at the beginning of the answer. So employee again could be rehire. If the clue indicates an undoing or negating of an action, try UN at the beginning of the answer. Remove a knot, untie. If a clue indicates being or doing like someone or something, it's looking for a ver verb associated with that person, like emulate Edison would be invent. 
Participles and gerunds, if you remember your fifth grade English class, uh, remember that a clue that looks like a past tense verb or a gerund ending in ing may yield an adjective rather than yielding another verb. Like noted could be famous or giving could be kind, even though they look like verbs, they're actually uh, adjectives in this case and the answer would be an adjective. And then there are ambiguous tenses. Um, Many verbs can be either present or past tense. Put could be yield place or placed. Set could, is both a present and a past tense verb. Uh, hit is, a, could, is both a present and a past tense verb. So when you see those words, you have to, you have to remember your tenses that, that could be ambiguous. Okay, um, foreign words. There are a couple of different ways for foreign words to be indicated. Uh, explicit would be if they actually tell you the language with one of those abbreviations we talked about. An implicit clue would have something that indicates what language it should be in, but doesn't specifically tell it to you. Um, so that would be implied. So boy in Spanish is Nino. If the clue said Tijuana boy, you will know it's going to be Spanish because you've got Tijuana in there. State in French is Etat, E-T-A-T, or Pierre's state. You know it's French because of Pierre. Uh, this is uh, this is a cute one. One more than two in Italian is tre, the word for three. Or an implicit clue. Look at this one. Look how clever this is. One over d u e. It's not overdue. It's not one word. There's a there's a space in between over and do. Uh, in Italian, one over the number two due is tre. Clever clue. Again, these are little gems and I just love them. So I hope you appreciate them too. No in German is nine and Berlin refusal would be the implicit version of that. First month in Spanish is enero, another really common quest for puzzle answer, or it could be a calendario page. It's in Spanish so that you know the answer is gonna be in Spanish. Abbreviations and shortenings again can be Explicit, where they tell you it's an abbreviation, or they use words like for short or nickname, or they can imply that it's going to be an abbreviation or shortening. Airport arrival time, abbreviation, would be ETA, estimated time of arrival. Or if they say DCA, that's the time it arrives at, at National Airport, the DCA is abbreviated, so you know that the answer will be abbreviated too. Fast flyer, SST, supersonic transit. They use that a lot. It's a real useful combination of letters. Um, or they could say Concord EG. The EG is an abbreviation, and that would indicate that you're going to get an answer that's an abbreviation. Public servant, for short, would be a Paul. Or the implicit clue could be DEM or REP. You know it's going to be a, a short answer because DEM and REP are shortened. The presidential nickname would, could be Abe, but if it says honest Prez, and the honest there just naturally goes with Abe, and Prez also is a shortened version, you know, there again, you've got an implicit answer of Abe. Oops, oh, slang, I didn't do slang. Um, if the answer to a clue is a slang word or phrase, the clue will also indicate this. The clue, again, can ex explicitly state that the answer contains slang or colloquial um, or informally. There's a couple of ways that it can be explicit, or the implicit clue would just use slang in the clue itself to indicate that the answer should have uh, slang in it. Gangster's girlfriend is mall, but if you see a clue of hoods, gal, that's slangy and you get the same answer. Beer could be the colloquial, would be suds. Um, or brusky, that's already slang, so the answer is going to be slangy. Food, informally, it tells you that specifically says in, that it's, in, uh, it's informal, so that could be grub, or chow is, there again, a slangy word, so the answer will be slang. Okay, we have a lot of clues that will go from general to specific or specific to general. Um, Specific to general could be something like a uh, loafer, for example. So loafer could be a type of shoe. Yellow or scarlet 
are specific examples of types of fevers. May, say, is one of many months, so the answer there is ma. So the say is, is the indication that it's an example, a specific example of something more general. Going from general to specific, some ribs could be prime, kind of a state can be real. One of the keys can be E flat. We have, uh, there's a lot of examples of musical type uh, answers. So this is one of the keys that's going from general to specific. Okay, some more embedded hints. First and last name. If the clue indicates someone's first or last name, the answer will also be a first or last name, respectively. So Lucy's husband would be Desi. It would not be Arnez. Lucy is a first name, so the answer would be a first name. Lewis's partner would be Clark. There would be last names. If the clue is an exclamation, it will be in quotes, and the answer will also be a spoken exclamation. Like, woe is me is a laugh. Not a chance, it's no way. This could be bad, uh-oh. Um, there are partials like half of an insect, see, like see, see, fly, part of a board game could be tic-tac or toe. Poetic or biblical, before to keeps would be ERE, but another very common answer. An anthem preposition, or as in, or the ramparts we watched. A biblical ending could be ETH, like go with. And here's a really clever clue. Second person in Garden of Eden. It's for Liz, you're not gonna get Eve in there. Garden of Eden is biblical. And second person is like the word you is a second person pronoun. You in a biblical sense would be thou. Really clever, a lot going on in that clue. Uh, preposition add-ons um, will often show you like seek with uh, an add-on of for. So it would be search for is uh, the same as seek or must needs to is the same as must. must. That's to keep everything. Again, they have to, uh, clue and answer have to agree. And then there are multi-word and hyphenate answers that are can look really weird. Equal, on a par, that's three words there. Um, and it can tell you some, uh, some puzzles will give you clues like three words or hyphenated, donkey's call is he haw. Um, not all puzzles will do that, but you have to be aware that you're not gonna be entering hyphens or spaces. You're gonna just put all those letters one right after the other. Letter pattern analysis. Uh, though spelling in the English language can be maddeningly irregular, you can still make good use of certain familiar patterns. You think of the probability of letters and letter combinations, um, of likely sequences of consonants and vowels, and position within an answer. For instance, some letters are very rare at the end of a word, not impossible, but very rare, and I, I list some of those there. Uh, that list of uh, consonants there are almost always followed by a vowel when they're at the start of a word. N before G, a final G is, is a very strong association as is uh, G before final HT or U after Q, of course. Uh, the vowel consonant sequences are, you know, you have to keep aware of that where a vowel or a consonant looks most likely. And you can get very odd letter combinations in certain circumstances. We've mentioned some of those, those multi-words, shortenings, foreign words, and again, that dreaded text shorthand you can have um, really odd letters that don't look like they should be making a word, but they can be valid. There are self-referential or meta clues um, where the clue refers to the actual letters or words within the clue itself or within the answer. So a clue extension would be land's end. It's re referring to the actual word land and an end to that could be scape as in landscape. Uh, verse opening could be uni. That's an opening for the, uh, of those letters. You get the word universe by putting uni in front of verse. Uh, the clue can refer to the letters in the words of the clue. So pre-op sequence. Here, OP is actually the sequence of letters in the alphabet and LMN can uh, be, be pre-OP. 
I've seen that clue. I'm not happy with it, but you sometimes see things like that. Nine has two, it has two ends in it. And ends are spelled E-N and you know, they have to make a three letter word out of it. So there's ends. Start of April is a long A. The song ender can be a hard G. The word song itself ends with a hard G sound. Um, and the answer may describe the words in the clue. Uh, here's a few cute ones I found. Mice and men are both plurals. Hot and heavy are both adjectives. Uh, and the EG shows that you're gonna use a shortening. So it's ADJ instead of spelling out the whole word. Uh, single for one. This is also very clever. Single is a synonym for one. So the answer here is synonym. Pretty clever. Think about that one a while. Crossover answers are ones that point to other answers in, in the grid. For example, if the clue for 60 across says beginning of a humorous poem, poem which ends at 70 across, 60 across might be candy is dandy, but 70 across might be liquor is quicker. And then 80 across might say the author of 60 and 70 across is Ogden Nash, one of my favorite poets. And uh, so these are clues that point to other places in, in the grid. Pronunciation. When reading a clue, remember that words in the clue may have more than one pronunciation and that different pronunciations may indicate completely different meanings and parts of speech even. These are called heteronyms. So we have T-O-W-E-R. That could be a tower, something that toes, like a tug, or even like A-A-A, triple A does a lot of towing. I've seen that as an answer to that clue. Or it could be a tower, which is a steeple. L-E-A-D could be lead, a metal, or it could be the verb lead, yielding guide. We could have entrance, which is charm, or entrance, which is a door. We could have Polish, which is a slav, or Polish, which is shine. These are just some of the very many, many. So I just wanna emphasize here the importance of really looking at the clue very carefully from all possible points of view. And here, this is my personal favorite, the masked capital. Every clue starts with a capital letter. You can't always be sure whether the first word of the clue is a proper noun that would normally be capitalized, or if it's just a plain old word that would be uncapitalized, but it's got a capital because it's the first word of the clue. And this makes great use of the ambigu ambiguity in here. Here are some examples where the first word of the clue is a proper noun that is also a normal word. Comet target, comet being the cleanser, would be a sink. Time worker, could be an editor if that editor works at Time magazine. Post production, would be cereal from the, you know, the food company Post. Singer specialty, you know, singer sewing machines. Also, like Tide shows up a lot, Dodge, Apple, those are very common products that appear as the first letter, first word of a clue, and you don't know whether you're talking about a word or a product name. People. Uh, tiger's goal, that would be the golfer Tiger Wood, and his goal is par. That's not begin. Uh, you have to pronounce it differently. It's bacon, and he, the prime minister of Israel, so he would be Israeli. Brooks could be, you know, rivers or streams, but here it's Mel Brooks. And John of England, John, uh, it, could, it looks like it could be John Lennon or Elton John. But in fact, John is the word for, is a word for toilet and a, a toilet in England is a loo. So any uh, last name that's also a word, Bill Gates, Lucille Ball, George Bush, those are all, uh, you know, possible samples for this kind of mass capital. And then there's Francis Bacon. My friend Helen, who is probably watching this uh, broadcast now, told me she read a clue that was Bacon's partner and being a literary sort of person, she assumed it was Sir Francis Bacon, a great English writer. 
So she starts researching whether Sir Francis Bacon had a uh, partner, a wife, a writing partner, whatever. When in fact, the answer was just egg and Bacon was capitalized because it was the first word of the, the clue. If the clue had been partner of Bacon, then Bacon would be not capitalized and you'd know right away that's an egg. If it had been Sir Francis Bacon, then if you put the clue in that order, then Bacon would be capitalized in the middle of the clue and then you'd know it was Francis Bacon. So gotta you know keep your mental flexibility going. All right, places. Turkey part, Turkey could be, you know, a bird or it could be the uh, the country of Turkey and Ankara is the capital. It looks like that could be a mobile home or it could be the home of the city Mobile, Alabama. And red for one, we've seen this before, that could be the color or it could be the red C. So in all of these, the capital letter at the beginning, you can't really tell whether it's a true proper name or if it just happens to be the first word of a, uh, it, it's capitalized because it's the first word of a clue. Okay, themes. Um, theme answers usually appear symmetrically in the grid, usually in the longest answers, and they will have a consistent topic or pattern. The title of a, of a clued puzzle might supply a hint, or there may be an embedded uh, answer somewhere in the puddle that in the puzzle that tells you what the uh, theme is. So here are a couple of um, numbers, colors, foods, animals, geography, flowers, clothes. You can have quotes, poems, jokes, and riddles that may, uh, like the uh, uh, the liquor is quicker one, that will extend over several different lines and several different answers. There could be modified spelling. You add or subtract a letter from all of the theme words or replace one consistently with a different letter. Um, there can be rebuses where the squares are filled with more than one letter, such or with numbers or multiple, you know, uh, with, with actual pictures. You can have a pattern over the whole grid. I once did a puzzle where the word star would have to be placed within a single square in seven different places that made the pattern of the Big Dipper. It was just a beautiful puzzle. I've seen Valentine shapes, fish hook shapes. I've seen puzzles where the uh, constructor didn't use the letter E at all, which sounds, you know, talk about obsessive. Um, or there can be consistent types of word wordplay, anagrams, palindromes, uh, malapropisms. Anyway, there can be themes and, you know, if you're lucky, you're, they're going to get, you know, really clever and interesting ones. Some common odd usages. To a T. So you'll have the T-O-A-T in a, filling in an answer. A1 is common. Uh, I see, not I. Playground retorts like am not, are to, is so, those kinds of things, you know, appear fairly commonly. Compass directions, ESE, and NW. Roman numerals can be used in math or in years or hours on a clock, so you'll sometimes see the letters from Roman numerals. Music notations like a key, um, uh, A minor, uh, B flat, that sort of thing. You'll see tra as in tra la la, you'll see plurals of the so re me, which I think is kind of iffy, but they're very common. Plurals of two-letter abbreviations, like AMs and PMs, I think that's pretty iffy. ORs and ERs, like operating in emergency rooms, ETs, extraterrestrials, uh, KOs, knockouts, TDs, touchdowns. So you'll get that it's common and, and it just has an odd look to it. Um, You'll get Wheel of Fortune requests. I'm, I'm not a big fan of Wheel of Fortune, but I understand you can request an A or an E, like a vowel or X. It, it, it would be a, you know, an A, letter A, N, and then some vowel. So it would be a Wheel of Fortune request. Letters on a telephone button or any other alphabetic sequence. Keys on a keyboard, like tab, control, escape. Again, we talked about text shorthand spelled out Greek letters, alpha and beta and so on. Radio and TV stations or um, airport codes, DCA, IAD, BWI for our locals. Clever misdirection. This is uh, where clues are deliberately and cleverly leading you to an incorrect first impression of their meaning. 
Uh, here are some examples. I just love all of these, so I just put them in here so you can you know, appreciate the beauty of some of these clues. Choose window instead of aisle. Uh, elope. So you have decided to climb out the window on a ladder rather than walk down the aisle. Sign of spring. Uh, not a flower, it's Aries, one of the uh, zodiac signs. Leaves home. Tea bag is a home for tea leaves. Tired state. Ohio is a state where they make lots of tires. Cock and bull are males. Um, this answer has nothing to do with nonsense or lying. Um, note that like rooster and stallion could be yield the same answer, but wouldn't be nearly as clever as cock and bull. First place was Eden. Current event, a shock. Present time could be Noel or Yule or even Xmas, X-M-A-S. Early summer, Abacus did summing back in the early days. Inside shot, X-ray, lab safety organization. This is uh, Labrador Retrievers, um, SPCA. And this was a recent one I just saw in a puzzle just a week or two ago. Steps taken in an emergency, fire escape. Pretty clever. Um, I'm going to do one particular clue and its answer that demonstrates many of the uh, different uh, tips that we've discussed. There's the clue, N-I-C-E, time, and the answer is E-T-E, which is the French word for summer, A-K. So we've got mask pronunciation. Uh, the clue word looks like it should be nice, a nice time, um, but in fact it rhymes with, uh, it's more like it's the word Nice, which is a city in, uh, in France. So the it's, um, so that's, that's the uh, pronunciation problem. Part of speech. Uh, at first glance, uh, nice looks like the adjective pleasant rather than a place name. Uh, implied foreign language, the clue referred to a city in France, so that implies that the answer is a French word. The masked capital letter. Uh, the word nice isn't normally capitalized, but it's capitalized here because it's the first word of the clue. And you can't tell whether it's nice or nice from, from the capitalization. And et is just a really common crossword answer. Uh, et and a great letters for uh, constructors to fit into their grid. And plus it's clever mis misdirection because it's clever and it misdirects you. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up with one awesome crossword puzzle. Um, and I use the word awesome with its original meaning that it inspires awe. So let's look at this. This puzzle appeared in the New York Times on Tuesday, November 5th, 1996. This is a presidential election day. Bill Clinton was running against Bob Dole. The puzzle is uh, done by a man named Jeremiah Farrell, who was a math professor. Oh, by the way, I mentioned that clues cannot be uh, copyrighted, but whole puzzles can be. But I have an email from New York Times puzzle editor Will Shorts himself that says it's okay for me to use these puzzles for my classes. And I'm using that as legal advice that it's okay for me to do this. Okay, here's the original grid. It's a basic Tuesday puzzle. Um, it ha will have a theme, uh, which is the election day theme. Uh, it's 15 by 15, about 15% black squares, which is typical for a Tuesday level puzzle. Here's the puzzle filled in, except for a certain seven letters in the middle. Um, 17 across, which if you know, can't read it, is the third uh, row down. It goes all the way across. And the clue is forecast. And the answer is prognostication to go with the uh, election day theme. 68 across the third row. It's title for 39 across next year. And the answer is Mr. President. Okay, we'll get to 39 across. 39 across is paired with 43 across, and it says lead story in tomorrow's newspaper. So we have seven letters there and then elected. So in other words, tomorrow's newspaper on Wednesday, the day after election day, will say that somebody was elected. Now we have to solve the seven crossing clues clues against uh, 39 across to get the possible answers. 
39 down is a black Halloween animal. Now that could be a bat or it could be a cat. 40 down, a French 101 word could be we, oui, O U I, yes, or Louis, which is uh, French for him. 41 down, provider of support for short, could be an IRA or it could be a bra. 23 down, sewing shop purchase, could be a yard or it could be yarn. 27 down, short writing, could be bio, short for biographies or bits that you write. 35 down, trumpet could be to blast or to boast. 42 down, much debated political initials, could be ERA, Equal Rights Amendment, or NRA, National Rifle Association. So what do we end up with here when you fill it in? The slashes separate on the top left of the slash, if you read across, it says Clinton, and then 39 and 43 across is Clinton elected. If you read the bottom right of the slashes, it's Bob Dole, Bob Dole elected. So no matter how you fill this out, you would have been right and the puzzle would be right. I don't need to tell you since this came out on that Tuesday morning, the New York Times uh, switchboard was inundated with irate callers saying, how dare you predict an election on the morning of the election? This, you know, we're just outraged by this whole thing. And then when they realized what happened here, um, they were silenced. This is an absolutely brilliant puzzle because not only do those seven crossing words have to have either of those specific two letters, they also have to have the exact same clue to yield both. And all of the other crossings going across the crossing have to work out into a pretty decent New York Times quality puzzle. This is just astounding. It's just, um, it's just brilliant. And um, I hope you'll you know, get a chance to really look at this and understand what went into a puzzle like this. So that is my presentation. Um, I hope we have some questions here that I can help answer. And I hope you enjoyed what we had to talk about. And I hope you learned something too. So um, Louise, do we have any questions? Adrian, um, well, I learned a lot. I made notes to myself, keep lists, uh, look things up because I consider it cheating if I look it up. So I'm gonna give myself permission. Uh, Wordplay video is uh, on my list of things to see. So I had have tons of clues. So thank you. I thought this was just great. Um, Paul uh, just mentions initially that the New York Times daily mini crossword, the five by five and the uh, seven by seven on Saturday is free to subscribers, no extra charge. So just pointing that out. Thank you, Paul. And Mary Lou Collins uh, poses question, what does a puzzle, puzzle editor do as opposed to a constructor? Uh, good question. <laughs> the constructor will develop the basic puzzle. Um, and we'll, also, we'll have the grid filled out and their own choice of uh, clues. You send it to a good editor. Well, besides the usual, the, the fact checking, everything has to be exactly right. Um, they will check for quality. They will check for degree of difficulty. So if a publisher wants to put it on a Monday puzzle or a Thursday puzzle, the clues have to be uh, properly aligned for the degree of difficulty. Um, and it has to have a certain degree of cleverness and fun about it. Uh, if all of the clues are just straight definitions or synonyms, it's going to be a boring puzzle and people are not going to want to do those puzzles. Uh, so they try to keep it uh, a, a good combination of types of clues to keep it uh, more interesting. So that's what the editor is in charge of. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Peter uh, Karnick's uh, says, great lecture, thank you very much. Um, Wally, uh, you posted a question up there and when I responded that we get to it later, it evaporated. Can you just chime in and ask your question, Wally? Just unmute yourself. Wally? I, I think he has to raise his hand and then we can uh, um, unmute him. Okay, Wally, can you raise your hand and then we'll unmute you?
had to do with, uh, I, I, didn't, I never heard the word before, rebuses, uh, Adrian? Rebuses, rebuses. Rebuses, okay. But I don't know specifically what it, what it was. Rebus will usually be having more than one letter in the same square. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't know that had a name. And like the, the Big Dipper uh, puzzle that I talked about, the, there were seven squares that actually had the whole word star uh, in that right. square. So star was part of all, all of the crossing uh, answers. Okay. Uh, his question, uh, Anne uh, uh, chimed in. His question was about the tip, what tips off that rebuses are being used? Uh, usually your first tip is you know what the answer is and it's just not gonna fit. And you get more than one of those and you know that you're gonna be dealing with a rebus. Usually the theme will give you some hint about that or there'll often be uh, an answer somewhere in the puzzle that alerts you to what you're, what you're doing in here and, and why they're, they're doing these rebuses. Um, rebuses okay. are, are very challenging because we're used to you know, one letter to a square, and that's that's what we want to do. But, you know, you've got to, again, open your mind and be a little more flexible. And when, when you know what an answer is and you can't fit it in, consider the possibility that it's a rebus. I always feel great when I figure that out. I mean, I just feel brilliant that that, <laughs> that happened. Um, any other questions for Adrian? So, I mean, while, while his mic is open, if you still want him to ask his question. I, I think that was the question, Wally, wasn't oh. it? Yes, oh, okay. uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute, but that was the question and appreciate the answer. And great lecture, by the way. Thank you. Uh, well, before you all go, and before we let uh, Adrian go, first of all, I want to just thank you, Adrian. I thought your, your talk was just great. And thank I you. think we a lot of us have interest in crossword puzzles and you, you, you brought to light to me some of the things I knew, you know, the constructions and kind of gave them names and uh, taught me a lot, so thank you.